which brings me back to PARA. So I know PARA stands for a, a great acronym. And if we wanted people to be able to take action and just understand what are the basics of PARA, could you walk us through that? So PARA is, a, is an acronym, four-letter acronym, uh, P-A-R-A. And it is a very specific solution to a very specific problem, which is how do you get organized? right? Like that eternal timeless problem. I have a bunch of stuff. In this case, I'm mostly talking about digital information because so much of our lives is, is now digital. How do I get it together? How do I get it organized, get it in order? Um, I actually think there's a solution to that. And it's a relatively simple one, uh, which is para. And I think the key, we can get into what those letters mean, but the key, there's a key principle. There's an organizing principle at work here which is to not organize content according to subject. That is the main mistake that people make. They try to create almost like a Dewey Decimal system for their lives, you know, like business ideas and book notes and, uh, I don't know, psychology, uh, highlights and different things, like different categories, which just causes an endless proliferation of more and more and more categories until you've forgotten what categories even exist and then you just abandon the whole thing. What Para does is change the basis on which you organize to what is actionable. Another way of thinking about this is in terms of time. There's certain information that you need access to now, which is just a small percentage of it. There's another set of information, which is a bit bigger, which you need access to in the medium term. And then there's another batch of information, which is most of it, which is just for the long term or someday or eventually or sometime in the future. And if you think of, you know, different horizons, short-term horizon, medium-term horizon, long-term horizon, it's actually quite easy to tell on which horizon something belongs. You know, the project for that collaboration you're doing this week that you're going to need to reference tomorrow or the next day is short-term. Whereas, you know, the notes on, uh, I don't know, the user manual for your dryer at home is probably long-term. Right? It's like, maybe someday I'll need to reference that, but there's nothing in the short term. Uh, and that is, that is the, main, the main principle on which Para operates. I'm going to ask for some specific examples that relate to sale in a minute. But um, when it comes to putting together these projects, like, is there a certain number of projects that is a kind of an upper limit that we can manage uh, that we have to be like, okay, if we're, if we're having this many projects that are kind of happening in the short term in our lives, like we need to start, you know, focusing or else you know, we're just going to get paralyzed. Yeah, I usually, I call this the 10 to 15 rule. I find 10 to 15 projects is a kind of sweet spot. Uh, and the interesting thing about that is I find around half of people have way more than that and they need to dial it back. They need to say no to some things, cancel, defer some things and sort of narrow their focus, their attention. Uh, but the other half of people, just as many people actually need more projects which is the opposite. Again, this is the begin the beginner advice is, oh, pick one thing, your top priority and just heads down do that one thing until it's finished. But which is true. That is good advice for a beginner. But once you do that for a while, you start to notice that oftentimes the one thing you're supposed to be doing is blocked. Right? It can't move forward. You're waiting on something to happen. You're waiting on someone to get back to you. You're waiting for some piece of feedback or whatever. And if you only have one thing and you have nothing else to turn to, you're now completely, you're completely stopped. You're completely blocked. Whereas if you have a few things going at once, you have a few, you know, pots on the stove, anytime one is blocked, you can turn to the other, make that, make progress on that until that gets stopped, move to something else. You always have something that you can move forward on some front. Um, and I find that the, the balance between those two things is usually around 10 to 15. It's interesting you, you say that because, you know, I've, I'm a big fan of the one thing, you know, the book, um, you know, I think it's Gary Keller, the author. Um, so I read that book, love its premise. And I think, again, is, is fact, like you're always doing one thing at a time. And from what I understand, I don't think you're advocating here for context switching very rapidly, but you're, you're speaking about the reality of work to be done that we're going to face blockers on a regular basis. And I'll tell you, I'm, uh, I'm managing an organization that's actually based in America and I'm out in Southeast Asia. And so a lot of times my blocker is communications with people. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm starting my day 
I have a ton of things to react to. Then I have a ton of projects I need to move forward, but they all hit these blockers. And there's this anxiety that I have to sit with, which is like, I get excited about a project and I want to focus on it. And then I get a point where I can't move on it. And then I'm just like, I feel like I'm losing my productivity by doing this switch to another project. So do you find that that kind of context switch pays an enormous toll as it seems to be portrayed around the, the, the enemy is multitasking or maybe are we again having to have a mindset shift? Yeah, I think uh, there's an there's a good distinction here. So context switching is very different when it happens on the level of tasks versus the level of projects. Task level context switching is usually not a good idea. That's where you're like responding to an email and mid task you, you are interrupted or you interrupt yourself and you go and look at your phone and you're typing a message mid message, you turn to something else and, you know, pay attention to some video mid task. You keep going from mid task to mid task. That's bad. Right. With few exceptions, that is, that is not a good idea, but projects are very different, right? Cause a project you might work on for hours, you know, one hour, two hour, three hours, but then you reach that point where you can't go any further right? Which is almost always the case. Like when is there a project that you can just start and go all the way to the end of the project in one sitting? That's like, that's impossible. That never happens, right? The very nature of a project is that it, it spans multiple days or weeks or even months, multiple work sessions. So, so you, in a way you have to do context switches anyway, from one day to the next, from the morning to the afternoon, from this week to next week, right? So given that you have to make context switches with projects just because of their duration, my, my mission then, my message is how can you make those context switches more efficient? How can you make it so the context switch from one project to another is not jarring and discombobulating, but is actually graceful, is actually like a pivot, almost like in a sport, from doing one move to kind of flowing seamlessly into another move where you're actually using the energy from the previous action and flowing it right into the next action in a way that is, like my Brazilian perspective, fluid, natural, and organic. Thank you so much for listening to the Selling with Love podcast. We have some previous episodes you can tune into right here. And if you prefer the short form content where you get to the point in under 10 minutes, we do have a ton of clips from our best episodes that are being shared on this channel as well. So pick which one supports you the most. And of course, thank you for liking, subscribing, and of course, selling with love.